I'm going to start out today by talking about a talking donkey. Not that donkey. <laughs> can, can, I, can I confess something to you guys? I've never seen Shrek. What? what? Actually, okay, I, that's a little more of a violent reaction than I expected <laughs> by saying that. I, I should have watched it as research this week. I will try to watch it this week. But we're not talking about that talking donkey. We're also not talking about that talking donkey. So there's some days Eeyore is my spirit animal. Not often, though. But we're going to talk about this donkey. Because everybody knows, maybe I don't need to. You guys all know this story, right? The story of the talking donkey from Numbers, right? Yeah, everybody, okay, we'll just move on. No. <laughs> In the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, there we go. We have this story of, it, the story really isn't about the donkey. It's actually about um, a man named uh, Balaam. We have this situation where the Israelites, if you read through the, the first five books, the Pentateuch or the Torah, big fancy words, you probably don't need to know those. But if you read through those first five books, the books of Moses, we get to this point in Numbers where the Israelites have, they've been successful in battle. And they're coming to an area around Moab. And the Moabites are a little bit worried about the Israelites. And so a man named uh, Balak goes to a man named Balaam. And he says to him, well, he doesn't go. He sends some servants first. But essentially, the request is, Balaam, what you do come, happens. So will you please go to the Israelites and curse them? And Balaam says, well, let me pray first. And he talks to God, and God says, no, no, I don't want you to do that. But kind of go anyway. So Balaam gets on his donkey, and he starts riding his donkey, even though he's not going to go and curse the Israelites. He's riding his donkey, and the donkey sees an angel of the Lord. And so the donkey veers off the path. Well, Balaam doesn't see the angel, but the donkey does. And so Balaam is wondering why the donkey veers off the path, so he beats the donkey. And they're going down a path in a vineyard, and there's not a lot of room on either side. There's walls on either side. And the angel appears again in front of Balaam and the donkey. And so the donkey comes off to the side and actually crunches Balaam's foot between the donkey and the wall. So Balaam beats the donkey again. So then they're going further down the path, and the angel appears again, but this time there's no room to go right, there's no room to go left, the donkey can't turn around, but the donkey sees the angel, so the donkey sits down. What do you think Balaam did? He beat the donkey again. So at this point, God allows the donkey to speak. You ever heard of talking donkey before? doesn't happen too often. But apparently it's not that weird to Balaam, which is interesting. And the donkey says, what have I done to you? Why are you beating me? I'm your donkey. Don't you know me? You, you got to realize there's probably a good reason why I'm doing these things. And Balaam is basically like, oh, yeah, okay, that's, that makes sense. So then the angel of the Lord becomes visible to Balaam. Balaam sees it and understands why the donkey stopped. Balaam gets to the point where um, uh, Balak is, and it, there's more to the story, of course. And essentially, Balaam refuses to curse the Israelites. So we sort of start out well with this story, but we're going to come back to it in a little while, because this plays a role in our, uh, in our letter today. So just keep in mind, not so much the talking donkey, but Balaam and what Balaam did back in Numbers. So let's move on. So we're talking about Pergamum today. So if you want to remember, here is Western modern-day Turkey. We'll zoom in and see Pergamum is right there. Pergamum is a city that is filled with temples to various gods. 
lots and lots of different temples to different gods. There's an altar there to Zeus. The imperial cult, this emperor worship cult, is very prevalent in uh, Pergamum at this time. So we look at our letter, starting in verse 12. Our letter is structured like the other letters that we've read so far. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. And again, if you go back to that original, that, that early part of the vision that John has in verse 16 of chapter 1, John sees this. He sees in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. Remember, every one of these letters connects back to that introductory part of Revelation. So Jesus continues talking in this letter. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. Again, we have all these temples, all this bad stuff in Pergamum. Uh, if you haven't been part of my Sunday school class, there's a really good series uh, from Our Daily Bread on YouTube. I highly recommend you go look that up, the, the seven churches of Revelation. It's a Seven-part series, it's, it's been outstanding. He talks a lot more about this. Just keep in mind, Pergamum is full of temples and idol worship and really kind of icky stuff. I don't know how else to say it. Yet you remain true to my name. Good work. Gotta love those parts. You remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So again, there's this continuing idea of staying strong, keeping faith in Jesus. Now in our letter, we, we hear the name Antipas. Now the name might really sound familiar to you. You might tend to think of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the ruler of Galilee at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. This is a very different Antipas that we're talking about here in Pergamum. This Antipas, uh, probably a bishop in Pergamum, was martyred. Uh, tradition says it was during the reign of Nero, which was about 30 years or so before uh, John wrote Revelation. So Antipas was martyred. People saw it, and yet they remained faithful. That's a good thing. Then we move on. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Here's one of those, you're doing great, but not what you want to hear from Jesus. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Now remember what I said about Balaam as we started. He listened to God. He didn't curse the Israelites, right? So we kind of get this idea that, well, maybe he did the right thing. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, we got to continue on. Because what happens, Balaam might not curse the Israelites, but the Israelites still fall prey to the Moabites their religion, and the people. In, verse, in chapter 25 of Numbers, we read, While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So what does that have to do with, with Balaam? Well, we read a little bit later in Numbers. Are you still with me? I feel like this is just kind of going. But anyway, we read a little bit later in Numbers. Numbers 31, verse 16. They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to, unfaith to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident so that a plague struck the Lord's people. So Balaam may not have cursed the Israelites, but what it sounds like happened was Balaam said, well, I'm not going to curse them, but you know, if you send your women in there, and tempt the men, the men will do whatever the women want. Uh, Israelite men probably aren't a lot different from men today. They're, they fall prey to women. 
That's, I'm not blaming anyone here, I'm just saying that's something that happens. Come back. So th this is kind of what happens here, is Balaam says, I'm not going to curse them, but if you do this, they're going to fall on their own. And because the Israelites fell to this temptation, God brought a plague on them, and a lot of the Israelites died. So what in the world is going on in Pergamum? The people in Pergamum are involved, not, not the church, but the people of Pergamum are involved in idol worship in these temples. They participate in all these bad things, the sexual immorality, there's, there's eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, what's the big deal about that for Christians? So Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians, the food sacrifice to idols things. You guys probably have heard of this, don't eat food sacrifice to idols. It's not something we come across a lot today. I don't think I'm going to go to Hornbacher's and pick up a pound of ground beef that's been sacrificed to Zeus or anything like that. But what if it was? I go over there, I grab a pound of ground beef, make some meatloaf, it's delicious. I eat it up, I go back the next day, and somebody over there says, oh yeah, that, we sacrificed that to, to Baal before you ate it. Am I in trouble for that? I'm not, because I had nothing to do with it. The problem with the eating food sacrifice to idols is eating it as a sacrifice, eating it as worship to these different idols. So that's where the problem comes in, and that's, that's where the line is, right? You know it's sacrificed to idols, and you eat it as worship to that idol, to that God that is not the one true God. What's going on in Pergamum is that there are people from the church that are still participating in some of these things. They're still going to these temples and participating in idol worship, in sexual immorality, in worshiping those idols by eating that food that was sacrificed to them. And the church in Pergamum isn't doing much about it. Let's compare this to Ephesus a little bit. You guys remember Ephesus from a couple weeks ago? Ephesus was, uh, Jesus says to Ephesus, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Good job. But, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So what's likely going on in Ephesus is there are believers, people in the church that are sinning, and they're saying, okay, you're sinning, get out of the church. What's happening in Pergamum is the opposite. They're ignoring the sin that's going on in the church. Like I said, in Ephesus, the, the, they saw the sin in the people. They said, get out of the church, but they forgot to show the love of God to those people that were struggling. In Pergamum, they just ignored the sin. They didn't address it. They just said, oh, you guys are going to the... Okay, that's, that's cool. You guys go to the temple. Uh, all right, you, you guys do you. That's, that's okay. Just make sure you keep coming and, and putting money in the basket and everything. It's all right. They let the sin continue in Pergamum without addressing it. Verse 15 in our letter to Pergamum. Likewise, you, all, uh, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Everybody knows every, everything about the Nicolaitans, right? No. Um, back in Ephesus, again, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. In Pergamum, they have people that practice what the Nicolaitans practice. Who are the Nicolaitans? We don't know for sure. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of ideas. The thing to remember about this group is that they were doing something that was opposite of what Jesus taught us. So in Ephesus, they hate the teaching, they hate the theology of the Nicolaitans, but in Pergamum, followers of Nicolaitan teaching are in the church. The only modern-day example that I, could come, that I could come up with today is if a, a group of Jehovah's Witnesses or Latter-day Saints was here, and we just said to them, okay, yeah, um, you're okay, don't worry about it. 
we're not going to try to correct any of the theology or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, no, you're fine. You're just, you're fine. The challenge for us when we read through these letters is we got to find the balance now between Ephesus and Pergamum. We have to find the balance between that overly legalistic sin and get out that we read about in Ephesus and the far too casual approach of, meh, whatever you do, that's fine. Don't worry about it. God's not going to punish you. It's, it's okay. You've got to find the balance between these two. We cannot be afraid to confront sin, but we, cannot, we also cannot dissociate with people too quickly. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about how to address sin in the church. We're not going to go over that today, but Matthew 18 gives us uh, a guidance for how to address that within the church. Ephesus, Pergamum, where's the balance? Verse 16, repent therefore. Just like in Ephesus, Jesus gives the church a chance to do the right thing. Repent, recognize what you're doing isn't the right way. Turn around and let's get things right. Repent. Otherwise, it's another one of those uh-oh statements when you hear that from Jesus, right? Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Mike, why don't you, why don't you come step into my office for a minute? We just got to talk a little bit. I'm sure none of you else, others have been in that situation. I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice that phrase there, sword of my mouth. He doesn't say he's going to come and destroy people. That's not what he's saying. He's going to come, he's going to have a little chat with you. Not the chat you want to have with Jesus, but better to have a little chat than to be destroyed, right? As our letter starts to close, we have kind of the same part as a lot of these other letters. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And it continues. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. If you guys remember what manna is, we look back into Exodus. When the Israelites leave Egypt, they're out wandering in the desert, and they're hungry, and they're saying, well, we had all the food we wanted back in Egypt. They forgot that they were also slaves in Egypt, but you know they had all the food they wanted. And so God heard them complaining and said, all right, here's, here's food, here's manna. And so every morning this manna would cover the ground and the Israelites would go out, collect up enough for the day. They'd bring it back with them and that's what they would have to eat for the day. Well, then the manna wasn't enough. Like, we want meat, we're hungry, we want meat. And God said, fine, here's some quail. And they got tired of quail too, right? But the idea of manna is, is this needed food. It's life, right? Manna is literally life that the Israelites get in Exodus. But Jesus refers her here to hidden manna. And there's another idea with the fact that he says hidden manna here. When the temple fell, the Ark of the Covenant went somewhere. People don't really know where it is today. It'd be, it'd be really cool if they found it, right? I think that'd be awesome. But one of the ideas is that when it was, when it was uh, taken from the temple, it was actually hidden someplace. And that when the Messiah returns, the Messiah knows where it is, and it will, it will be returned. Well, within the Ark of the Covenant, as legend has it, there's a jar of manna. So the thought here, at least one of the thoughts here, is the hidden manna is actually referring to that jar of manna in the Ark of the Covenant that is hidden, that will be revealed when Jesus returns. But ultimately, whether it's hidden or visible, manna means life. It meant life to the Israelites. That life that we have in Jesus Christ, it's 
kind of hidden within us. We should be displaying it. We should be going out and doing the works that Jesus has for us to do. But I don't have anything on my forehead that says I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's in here, right? I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. A white stone. At this time, a white stone sometimes was an invitation. A little piece of marble, wrote your name on it, you went to the party, hi, I'm invited. It's a white stone. Christians aren't going to be getting this white stone in Pergamum in the first century. They're too outcast. They're not part of that group that gets to go to these parties. There's another possibility for what this white stone means. Again, back at this time, there, was, there were juries. And apparently one of the ways the juries would vote was with a little stone. A white stone meant innocent. And you'd drop that into the bucket to cast your vote for innocent. A black stone meant guilty. If you judge that person to be guilty, you'd drop the black stone in there. So does the white stone that Jesus is referring to here is that that vote for innocence? Again, we come to the point where what is the ultimate message here in this letter to Pergamum? Stay faithful to God. In Pergamum, some things are good, some things are not so good. People of Pergamum have some work to do. Situation is difficult. But stay faithful. And you will receive that hidden manna. You will receive life. You will receive the white stone. You will be judged innocent. You will be invited to the big party. What is the message for us today? It's the same thing. Stay faithful. Some things are good. Some things are not so good. Celebrate the good. Improve on the not so good. But whatever it is, whatever it is, Jesus is with us. So stay faithful to him. Amen.